Good evening, let's make a start. I might admit people as they come along, but let's start um, as it's not fair to keep people waiting who are here. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second talk in our short series titled With a View to North Wales. First of all, I'd like to thank attendees who have made a donation. Your contribution is much appreciated and all donations go towards the speaker's fee. In this series, with a view to North Wales, three photographers making work in and off North Wales tell us about their projects and photographic approaches. A month ago, we had a splendid talk given by Ethan Bessick. The talk has been recorded and you can find the recording on our regional website. It's been placed on the RPS YouTube channel, so you can access it either directly by going through YouTube or via our regional website. And how do you find it on our website? If you go to Regions North Wales, you look down at the bottom hand right corner, you see a tile called Recorded Talks. You click on it, and there it is. You can also watch Robert Law's talk from last autumn, where he talked about his documentary project about Holyhead. Now, I can only recommend and highly recommend watching those two recorded talks. We will host Robert Law again this coming May, where he will treat us to a different talk. But now back to tonight's presentation by Hazel Simcox. Hazel graduated from the Blackpool College and from St. Andrews University. Currently, she's teaching photography at North Warwickshire and South Leicestershire College. But as you are not here to listen to me, but to Hazel, I will now hand over to her. Amazing, right. Thanks, Rolf. And um, thanks all for coming. Um, I need to find out again how to share my screen, which I succeeded with before. So let's, uh, let's see if I can do it twice. There we go. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, lovely. Fabs. Right, um, where do I start? So I'm Hazel, thanks for the intro, Rolf. Um, and I've put down here that I'm a member of the North Wales Projects. I think this is a really important starting point for me to begin with. Um, I was invited to join the North Wales Project um, when Rob set it up a few years ago. Um, I felt extremely honoured to be invited to be part of it. I'd say probably the main reason being is that I am not actually living in or from North Wales, but I use North Wales as my photographic muse. And for Rob to recognise that connection still within my work, um, and also to see my work within the documentary strand, which is part of what the North Wales Project is about. Um, just, it, it, I was just really honoured and it was exactly what I wanted to be seen from my work. So to get that reassurance um, and the invite to be part of it was a really good starting point. So I'm not from North Wales. Um, I am from the other side of the border, uh, originally from near Cheshire. Um, and North Wales has always been on my doorstep. And as such, it's always been this kind of magical um, land. The other land that was just over yonder, it was where we went on holiday. It was where my ancestors were from. Um, it's this place that just resonated with me, the land of the dragons. And I've just always held it as this kind of like a magical entity the other side. Um, I'm aware there's obviously many, many strands in the narrative of North Wales, but I do look on it very much with those rose tinted black glasses. So um, that obviously comes through my work and my approach to what I'm doing. Um, so within my work, oh, my slides aren't working. Oh, that's what you said might happen, Rolf, isn't it? It worked last time. Let me just stop that share and go back again, see if I can get it to work this time. Uh, let me try it that way. Oh, works in practice, but not in reality. 
It did work mm. just before six o'clock. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I know. This is the six o'clock disease. Let me uh, let me just try it one more time and see if I can get that to uh if I go this way. If it through to it like that. And then if I go to screen share, will that make a difference? Yes. Oh, there we go. Cool. Right. Um, so most of my work takes place in the mountains. Um after sort of education, um, I went straight from that into teaching. Um, and when I went into teaching, I would say my photography practice kind of got put on a shelf um, as a young teacher focused on that. And my walking practice, like going out walking, exploring, became really important in my life. Um, and at a certain point, the two reconnected. Um, so I came back to the mountains, my camera came with me. Um, and the work that I'm going to really talk about comes from this period and um, from the last few years where I've sort of connected into the landscape uh, with the camera. So that's what we're going to be talking about is a lot about the landscape. A few years ago, um, just uh, after myself and my husband there, Dan, after we got married, um, we went away for a few weeks. And by the time we'd come home, my dad had, um, we got married in North Wales to set the context. Um, by the time we got home, my dad had sold his house in Crewe um, and had um, moved into temporary accommodation whilst he tried to find himself a house out in North Wales. Um, so he found spending that time there for our wedding, this drive to get him out there. Um, and with him buying a house over in Wales and having this space, it definitely drew me over there a lot more to go and visit him. Um, and because ultimately it gave us a free place to stay when I wanted to go into the mountains. So he's kind of given me the perfect, uh, the perfect base until, until COVID came along. Um, so whenever we went to visit him, we explored the woods um, just outside of his village. So he lives in Evergreen Olwen. And I just continually photographed every time we went back, I was capturing them. Um, and I'd say this started to become a body of work. It started becoming one of my first focuses. I was fascinated by the trees. I was fascinated by the weather. And I was fascinated by the change. And it was those three things that really drove me to it. We take a walk, a loop around. There's two versions, a few hour loop or an hour loop. But every time I ended up coming back with the same images, it was the same trees that seemed to be talking to me as if they wanted um, some attention. Um, and I ended up creating sort of this sort of archive of these different views. Um, and going back at different times, I've got oh, the, these two views are two of the stop offs. This is where the dog goes and paddles, and these are where I stop. And I've been capturing this exact same spot time and time again um, throughout the years and the seasons. And I was actually lucky to get back there last week and to, to make some more, which is it's been 18 months since I was back in this woodland. So to revisit was a, it just felt like seeing an old friend again. So this became. A sort of a body of work I just sort of was creating images I wasn't sure why I was creating images what it was about but I was starting to develop a visual style and appearance so all about this navy and this gold and I really trying to create a style not consciously but just through what I liked and what attracted me but I was ultimately just sitting on um a aesthetic body of work you know they, they look good um and they were going on to my instagram accounts and they were getting likes and I, I knew there was something more behind it um so what i'm going to talk about is how i've worked with different processes um and gone back to my roots of what i learned in my education um and try to bring what i love to do which is to wander to explore and to see and to turn it into bodies of work which have a context um, and a comprehension for the viewer. So that's the ongoing challenge that I always find with my work is that idea of how do I connect what I absolutely love to do, which is to be out in the mountains, um, to something that you know somebody sat at home might enjoy to, to view and will gain something from. And I think I find that quite important with photography is that it gives something more than a just a beauty. I think beauty is incredibly important. But um, that secondary layer is what I was hunting for. So at this point, I turned to get some help because I think that's ultimately what I needed. I needed some mentorship. Um, you know, I've got some great colleagues who support me and guide me, but I've been out of the photography world for, it was 10 years at that time since I'd graduated. 
Um, and as much as I was in teaching, and I was talking about photography all day, every day, um, I needed somebody just to kind of give me a shake up and to kind of make me realize what's going on. And uh, so I applied to be part of the East Meets West program and was accepted, which was fantastic. And it was a series of workshops over the year um, and some mentorship on your projects by different people in the industry. Um, I went along to the first one with my archive of beautiful images, a um, little bit cocky thinking they're gonna go, yeah, they're great and this is your concept. Um, and kind of got knocked off on pedestal a little bit, um, which I needed, I desperately needed. Um, and they, they sort of said exactly that. But when someone says it back at you, you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I need to do something different. Um, and I didn't want to change the way I photographed because ultimately the way I photograph is so important to me. It is what I do and I don't want to pick up the camera and try and look at the world in somebody else's eye. Um, so it was about the process afterwards that was really important. So I took some time um, and I looked back at where earlier inspirations have come from and I had to go to my hero Thomas Joshua Cooper who I um, I studied a lot when I did my masters. Um, I looked at the philosophy of time and photography and obviously his work um, absolutely um, meets that agenda. So I met with Thomas Joshua Cooper a few times to talk through his practice and do some interviews, um, which was an absolute honor to be up in his dark room and uh, to see how he works. What amazed me about his work is the locality of it, how they're based in places, but the place isn't visible and these views could be literally anywhere. And when I stopped and looked at the work I'd been producing, as much as I've been producing work in lots of different locations, I'd always wanted it to be that nobody would know where the location was, um, unless they knew that one specific tree or that one specific stream. Um, so that idea of them being transitional, them being mysterious, them also being re relatable to everybody and anybody. You, know, you look at these images um, and, you know, we all can kind of feel like we're stood on the edge of a river or the edge of a sea at some extremity that relates to us personally. And I think that's what's quite clever within his practice. But his work had a context, you know, it's about the extremities, it's about these locations. And when you get them together as a body of work, you really start engaging and you're in these places with him. And he talks about photographing them the same way a bear captures his prey. You know, he pounces, he uses time periods to take in as much or as little as he needs. Um, so inspired by Joshua Cooper, um, but also inspired by literature. And going to these workshops, the East Meets West workshops, every time I went along to a workshop, and I've done exactly the same today, I sit ready to do or to share my work, and I always have some sort of book right by me as if it's kind of like some sort of reassurance like these so i realized that literature was not just something i enjoy to read but something that actually gave me something slightly more a, a sort of guidance um a mentorship in a different right in a different sense and um i could have listed i started with slides with so many different authors and eventually i was like, actually let's just go for the key one so i had to put robin mcfarland's mountains of the mind up um reading this um was something i felt um i felt i needed to do i was going out to the mountains a lot and i was walking a lot um but it scares the hell out of me being out there um and Reading this, I wanted to do because I wanted to get some sort of narratives of the mountains, other people's thoughts, but I was always afraid of the stories I might hear. Um, you know, I'd started on Joe Simpson's Silence, which probably was not a good starting point in literature to go to because you get the, sort of the real stories in the mountains. But what Robert McFarlane explores is this complexity. Um, so he talks here, I've just included a few quotes. He talks about the complexity of being in the mountains and um, the bravery and the cowardness, the rest and the exertion, the danger and the safety, which when I'm out climbing, that's what it's all about. I think climbing is one of the safest things in the world because all we think about is danger. And every move you do and every action you make, where you put your rope, where you put your gear, is all about this complexity of danger and safety. Um, the right and the wrong, which way should you go, which way shouldn't you go? Uh, route finding, um, but all of them, they had this, this battle, they exist in the same world. 
And he sums it up really nicely when he looks at um, Edmund Burke's um, theory of the sublime. And that idea that the sublime, um, and I think that's what a lot of my work is about, these sublime environments, they cause terror. But ultimately, the terror that they present is a huge passion. Um, and when you see scenes like this, you know that I'm not alone in that feeling. Um, so this was up at Cadaridris, um, must have been 2019 now, two years ago. Um, and looking through when I picked out this image, it was from the 5th of Feb. So a bit of winter walking. Um, there's a little bit of camera trickery here. The queue, it wasn't a queue. These are just people walking, but uh, it definitely looks like a queue for the summit. Um, but it was, yeah, it was quite spaced out, really. But, you know, these are popular places to be. And they're popular places for a certain strand of imagery to, to take place. Um, imagery that I still enjoy to look at, you know, I love a beautiful image of the mountains. Um, but what I wanted with my work was something slightly, slightly different. So all these people up on the mountains, ultimately, all of them having a completely unique experience. Um, some feeling fear, some feeling elation, some just, you know, this is commonplace and not a bother. Um, when I was out in a book barn over um, in the Midlands, place I go whenever, I, whenever it's raining, <laughs> um, pre-COVID, um, incredible space, books galore, and really good tasty cake. Um, I sit down with my cake and my coffee and I just pick random books up and just spend some time just flicking through and in the, the walking section um, I picked off this book by Gwen Moffat um, who embarrassingly at the time when I realised who she was I knew nothing of her so Gwen Moffat um, was or is she, she was born in 1926 she's 95 now she lives up in the Lake District um, and she was the first British mountaineer, uh, which is a loose title because, of course, people are up in the mountains before her. But she sort of took this recognition on. Um, she was one of the members of um, the um, Women's Mountaineering Club and a really significant figure. And part of me thought, am I interested in her stories because I've suddenly found a female climber in history, which is an incredible find. Um, but more of it, it was about the way she talked. She talked about the mountains in this book, which is about her explorations, not just in North Wales, which is where she started, but all over the globe. She spent a lot of time in Chamonix and the Italian Alps, the Highlands in Scotland. Um, but the way she talked about them was really reassuring because she talked about them with so much confidence and so much playfulness. And I started, I didn't realise how much she was influencing me, but both myself and my husband had read this book and we'd be out on climbs and, you know, I'd, I'd stop and have a few tears because i get absolutely terrified. And he just turned to me and just say, what would Gwen do? I was like, she'd, she'd just do this. She wouldn't cry. She'd get on with it. Um, so I started using it as this sort of inspiration as to how I was going to cope with these moments. Um, so I'm just going to take a sip of water. So she's just sat here next to me as well. Can't, can't let her go. Um, <laughs> so I knew there was something going on. I knew her words were really important to me. Um, and this body of text here, page 17, she talks about ordinary route. Um, sorry, page 16, bottom. Um, on idle slabs and um i'd always wanted to do some winter climbing so we took an advantage of this idea that she'd done it and i actually went and did the, the this route that she references um for myself um and found that uh, my experience was somewhat different to hers um she talks i'm trying to find it now staring at the thing if i'm not a slide in a while hey i'll bring it up in a moment actually because I'll, I'll get onto that onto the next slide um so here we are yes went off to idwell so this is the a5 um that goes through uh, snowdonia um and triffin is one of the favorite routes of mine but we're only over here to idwell slabs just up in the back hand corner if you ever walk to the lake you'll see it sloping at the back looking super easy from the ground um <laughs> somewhat intimidating once you're halfway up and you know 
it was no it was it was a frightening route it was okay it was kind of quite um quite an eye-opener for me um, this is one of the images I took on the way down, you know, the, the rolling clouds coming in and I really felt this, this, this is how I felt. You know, this is a really good recollection of, of that emotion. Um, so of all these elements, I've got Gwen's inspiration, I've got the locations, I've got the photographs and I just then was struggling with what do I do? How do I piece it together? So I turned to some of those that had inspired me in the past. Um, Hamish Fulton's graphics, um, where he looks at how to present a walk without someone being on the walk, which I think for a, a walking artist or an artist in the environment is one of the biggest challenges. Um, and I, I'd use this as inspiration in the past um, towards this body of work, which you can always tell how old it is from my horrific use of Instagram filters. Um, I've got such an archive of uh, mountain trig points photographed with these filters on them. Um, you can't get rid of the filters. <laughs> um, these are teamed up with, um, these on the left are the circular roots um, and I've had them laser cut and then laid over um, colours that relate to the images to show the root and the height of the summit and the trig point. Um, so I looked back at all of this and could see that I was starting to work graphics. So was, was graphics something I needed to bring in? Roots? Is there something there? Um, I turned again to Richard Long, um, who also looks and is a walking artist who looks at the landscape. Um, and in some ways, looking at his work is a reassurance, but ultimately it can also feel a bit like a barrier because when I look at what he's done, it's what I want to be able to do. You know, I, he's nailed a process, a, an approach. Um, that absolutely works for telling these stories of these walks and if I was to have a go I'd end up just doing a copy and what I didn't want to do was that so I felt all of a sudden like I can't do this how do I put my images and text together when Richard Long is just incredible and I'm fascinated by his work um, and <laughs> here in a transcript from his a talk he did in 1997 um, he puts here at the end I'm going to I'm going to read these words about my work. Reality, time, memory, sleeping, counting, language, boots, solitude, maps, music, tent, humor, distance, intuition, experience, chance, and love. And I read that and I thought, damn, they're the same words I'd use. Minus music, because I don't really have much engagement with music. Um, I thought, like, how do I do this? This guy's mastered it. And within my teaching practice, I have the absolute pleasure of watching students do their presentations of their projects. And um, a student, um, Rajasri, was doing her dissertation presentation, um, which they do before they finish writing it to sort of verbalize what they're going to write. And she was presenting to me um, about the Dada movement and Dada collages and Dada movement being, Dada means nothing, it means nonsense. Um, and she talked about how do you make a Dada poem? So you take a newspaper, you take a pair of scissors, you cut it all up, you stick it in a bag, you throw it all around and you stick it back together. And that is your Dada poem. And as she said it, literally the penny just dropped. I was thinking about the text so literally. This wasn't literal. The, the words are separate, they're separate entities. I can work with them as words. Gwen Moffat's words inspire me. They're not, it's not her prose, it's not the, the whole book, it's the individual words. And um, so that night, with a skip in my step, um, I photocopied a few books before I left work and a uh, I got home with my marker pen and I started redacting and I was just at this point just experimenting with redacting and leaving words behind um, and the whole project just kind of came into context, it came together. So the project that is um, called Space Below My Feet, so this over on the left hand side, this is the title of Gwen's book, um, which at the time I thought was an ingenious title for a project but ever since, now I refer to it as Space My, and being from the MySpace era, I now think it's probably the worst title I've ever given a project. I can't change it because it's what it is. Um, this is the title um, that this project's become. Um, and I've looked at Gwen's book. I've taken the pages from her, 
her journeys. I relived the journeys for myself, whether in the exact location or within, she doesn't always give the exact location. So in, within the region, within the area um, of where she would have been walking and exploring. And I've then taken a text and redacted all the words that were not relevant to my experience. And what it left behind were words that are relevant to my experience, but come from Gwen's narrative. And I leave them exactly on the page where they were found. So the, the layout is consequence of that shared experience. So I, I feel in many ways, this is a collaboration with Gwen. Um, and I have shared the work with her, which uh, she, she came back to me and she didn't disapprove. So I, was, I feel like I've had her, uh, her approval that the project is, um, yeah, is accurate and is, is of interest to her as well. Um, so this one was, this is the same image I showed you before. And these are the words that were left behind. Um, half hearing the conversation, frozen, novices root, impressed. Iced in places, easy angle, climb. These are all relevant to me. You know, we'd fought the whole way up the mountain. You know, you're in a valley of that size. When one person puts down a command, um, it bounces off the other side of the mountain and comes back to you like a mouse's whisper. You know, you can't hear it. You can't chat. You just kind of, you've got to be blunt to the point. Um, and, you know, you start off having a conversation and then Dan moves five, six feet ahead of me. And all of a sudden the conversation's gone. And honestly, my fingers that day were just like, I thought they'd drop off. Um, so these words are so relevant to me. But when you actually read what she wrote about the whole thing, it's actually quite different. So she refers to it as a novice's route, and she was really unimpressed by it. Um, and she didn't seem to care about the fact she was frozen or that it was iced in places. In fact, she found that an invigoration. Um, and maybe I did as well. Um, but these, these words, they become this sort of intertwined narrative and I find that really fascinating. So I looked at obviously lots of different ways in which I could present them. Um, looked at using overlay of text over image, which I think if I was to go for book form, um, which I'm hoping this will become, I think that overlay will be really useful. Um, but for now, um, they're, they're predominantly going either into print or onto screen and of which this sort of layout that I've come up with seems to be working quite nicely. So there's a finished finished body of work that I can share, but I wouldn't say this is a finished project in the slightest, you know. At the moment, I focused on the stuff she's done in North Wales, which is about 20 pages in the book. Um, so there's another, you know, 200 pages um, of different locations and different walks of which I can go and explore and can really um, follow in her footsteps much more. Um, so this is this is ongoing. This image here, um, bewildered, less tolerant, thinking calmed down. I don't remember making any decision to go. Um, I honestly couldn't believe when I found these words. So this is a text where she's talking about walking in the dark. She's talking about coming down from Triffin and it's dark and she's trying to find a way. Um, and this walk, when I took this image, um, Dan and I had been on Cadaridris in the daytime. And then we'd got back down to my dad's and he's like, oh, I'm going over to the woods. Do you want to come for a walk? I'm like, yeah, of course. Um, I'll come to, I was like, it was dusk. You know, this is my favorite time to photograph. I was like, I'll come to the edge and then I'll, I'll head back and, you know, have a cup of tea and put my feet up. And then sort of two hours later, I'm still walking with him and we're up on a, the other side of the valley. Um, and I literally was getting quite, you know, less tolerant at this point. <laughs> and I really don't think I ever made any decision to go. I just kind of followed, my feet took me. Um, and then coming back and finding these words, it's just, it really kind of resonated with me. And some others are more literal. Ascent, ledge, I embarked, started walking alpine. And Upwards to the skyline, grey fogs, scrambled, that blank hour. And how many times do we get that blank hour? You, know, you go up into the mountains and you suddenly hit the, the cloud line and you get up into it and all of a sudden the world's gone and you just have that time to yourself until you get summit and back down the other side and you come out of the clouds and you, you, the world reappears before you. Um, so. And here is an image of it being exhibited over at the Oriole Colwyn um, 
alongside Rob Law's work over in the back there from our exhibition, from the North Wales Project exhibition that we put on last January, just before the lockdown, lucky to squeeze that one in, that went up, uh, yeah, January, um, and came down just before the lockdown, so. And here is uh, a picture of me and um, some prints that I was preparing um, just the other week, which are on their way over to Germany um, to be included in a touring exhibition um, that's going to be going on called Facing Britain, um, which looks at documentary uh, photography in Britain since the 60s. So I'm really honoured to have been included um, into that. So these prints are on the way over. They got lost in the post to begin with. They're on their second journey over. Um, so yeah and that's kind of that's where the project's at at the moment so I think I include this as sort of a, a full stop on where it's at you know it's, it's not finished it's not completed um, but it is it's in a form where I'm sharing it um, and I, it, that just gives me more excitement to keep going with it so I've got a few more projects to talk through um, I'm going to go a little bit quicker through the next one than I had planned to because I've, I've gibbered a little bit more on that one um, this is a, it's a very much an ongoing project. It's very much in its, its origins, its starting point. Um, this is a woodland in mid Wales um, that is part of the Welsh plant scheme. And the plant scheme is a scheme aiming to plant one tree per child that is born or adopted in Wales. And these woodlands um, started being produced about 12 years ago now. Um, and I'm not sure if they're on track with the number of trees in Wales, but they've connected over with a planting scheme over in Uganda as well. And they're now trying to plant one both in Wales and one out in Uganda. So it's a scheme that I find really fascinating. Um, I think it's, it's a great idea. Conceptually, it makes absolute perfect sense. So I went to this woods not knowing this, but you know, when you get there, you park up, you look at the sign and reading it, oh, this is interesting. And it actually made me walk around the woodland slightly differently. Um, at the time I was shooting colour film, so I was learning the colour printing, the colour processing um, to teach the students at work. Um, so I was just out really just to get some images that I could take back and have an explore. But what really fascinated me was that these trees, um, they were at the time 11 years old and they were just breaking out of their casing. So these plastic casings that they're, they're planted in, they were tearing their way out. And at the time, my students were doing a project called the Teenage Project, where they look at um, you know, the theme of teenage life, whether they are a teenager, whether they're a mature student looking back at their teenage life. And I was remembering um, a project that I'd done back when I was uh, studying at uni, uh, which was looking at this idea of coming of age um, and um, sort of growing up in a rural community and how you can form through attending clubs in uniform. And all of these themes were sort of playing around in my head, um, but I didn't want to create literal photographs that were sort of the tree breaking out of the casing. I wanted to show these trees coming of age. And also, the more I looked into this, this concept of the trees, I came to learn that it, is, it takes about 10 years before a tree um, is at its most productive in terms of its carbon storage. So these woodlands as well were just starting to function. So this idea of all coming of age, the trees coming of age, their functionality coming of age, they are young teenagers, the kids that were born and these were planted for them all started to seem to come together but again I was left with that conundrum of how do I translate that into something that doesn't just show you literally trees growing out um, I was really lucky to be accepted um, to take part in the positive light projects Dartmoor summer school um, which unfortunately they've only done one year because obviously last year's got cancelled um, but we went and spent a week out in uh, the Dartmoor um, training centre um, with incredible um, guidance from um, say all the guys, all, all the team are in here who helped us and all the participants, um, but Susan Durges uh, specifically was a, a great support to me and um, Jem Saldam here um, and it's Brendan Barry who set it up. I ended up on Brendan's workshop even though it wasn't one I'd been aware of and I'm really glad I did because I think this really revolutionised the way I was thinking and the whole notion of that summer school was about 
stop trying to over contextualize everything and that's ultimately what I was doing you know I was coming in I've got this idea I've got this context I need to work out an answer and what the whole week was about was just have fun just experiment have fun and play and it took me a while it took me a few days before I was I would kind of drop my barriers and let go of all that sort of baggage that I'd taken with me um, but ultimately just had an absolutely fantastic time experimenting and playing and I came home and I think that that one week continued on for like another two months as I just kept trying things out at home um, so Brendan Barry makes cameras out of literally anything and everything and he turned one of the rooms at the training center into a camera for us to use um, and this image down on the bottom left here is the image that I made whilst I was there um, so I obviously went home and you know, had a go and sat on my own camera. And I, I seemed, I, I was still on this, this tree concept. How do I photograph trees? How do I make this interesting? Um, and the camera obscura was fun. I was enjoying it, you know, getting some prints, positives and negatives. Um, these were just using loose branches. So obviously they were, went out with the actual trees. But it was at this point that I realised what I was trying to do was actually to create a portrait of the tree. Um, and treat them like these children that they're planted it on behalf of. So each one has a personality, each one is individual, each one is unique. Um, so ended up returning, um, but this time these are done again at home with the backdrop. But taking a backdrop out onto location to isolate them from their community and bring them out exactly as you would with a child coming in for their school portrait. So it was each of them had their turn in front of the camera. Um, and the backdrop that I took was quite thin um, material, um, which wasn't purposeful, but was actually a really, really happy accident because it shows the environment behind. It shows the hills and it shows the trees in the background to so put some in context. Um, so I still, I still want to continue with this, and um, yes, yeah, it's just one of the other North Wales sort of ideas I've got going on, and it's kind of work in progress. And I'm hoping that there'll be a way um, of building some sort of camera obscura, bird box um, style um, installation where you can go into the box and view it um, view through the camera um, to sort of get that experience where you see the tree completely differently and you really start to question and give it some time. Because um, I think we look at woodlands, we look at environments, but we don't look at the individuals. And I think you can, you can gain a lot from it. It's just stopping for a minute and looking at some bark, who knew? You know? Fascinating things. So that's to be returned to. There are two projects to be returned to, two based in Wales. Um, and then, hey, lockdown happens. That thing. Um, obviously, this shook everything up. Um, the borders, you know, we all, every border went down, didn't it? You know, you went down to literally being in your house in your garden. Um, and all of a sudden, I had a bit of extra time. So I said, this is a great creative opportunity. What do I do with it? How do I deal with this? So location became important. Getting the map out of the local area became important. Thinking about how maps and location can be used to inspire you um, was sort of my starting point. So I couldn't not turn and have a quick look at Mark Power's 26 different endings. He uses the London A to Z and goes to the edges of the map where London is no longer. Um, and photographs looking out. Um, so it's a very prescribed way of working. Um, and I felt like there was something here, this idea of being trapped into a grid space, um, however you define that grid space. We weren't literally, um, well, in Wales you were eventually, weren't you? You were put into a five mile radius, if that was ever possible. Um, in England, it always remained just stay in your local area, however you wanted to determine that. Um, so local area, so I think, what can I do? And looking back at Richard Long's work, this is something he's done in his practice. Um, his Nowhere, a walk of 131 miles within an imaginary circle, 10 days and nights from Scotland, 1993. Um, and I felt about this idea of limitation. What could I do within limitation? What, what freedom could I find within what I'd been given? So maps often have always fascinated me. I honestly could just stare at a map for hours. I can just, you know, stick your head in it and explore. Um, and Richard Long talks here about maps. 
he mentions that maps can be used to make a walk, but a map is also an artistic and poetic combination of image and language. Um, but ultimately, a map could save my life. You know, maps have so many uses, and I really wanted to use this to start off something within lockdown. Um, so turning to the map um, and knowing we, we'd, we moved to, um, to Whittock up here. Um, we'd moved to Whittock just a year before lockdown, so it's still relatively new, still exploring. And the, we knew this path went out the back of the house and um, the Ivanhoe way, and we hadn't yet had much chance to explore it. So this became a great opportunity. So it's a 40 mile circular, leaving Whittock, um, walking all the way around via Ashby de la Zouche, which is um, how it gets its name. So Ivanhoe references the Ashley, Ashby de la Zouche castle. Um, and Ashby's really taken it on everywhere um, around here. It's either called Ivanhoe Business Park or Ivanhoe, Ivanhoe College. Um, everything's named after Ivanhoe, the Sir Walter Scott novel. So I felt like there was something here. You know, I've got the Ivanhoe Way, I've got the Ivanhoe novel, I've got the map and I've got this location and we can walk this. Totally manageable. So I started walking it, started exploring it, 40 mile circular trail, doing it in fragments, um, doing it in halves, um, doing it in both directions, forwards and backwards. Um, I think we just went dizzy around the Ivanhoe Way for close on three months or so toing and froing and I photographed as I went but the one thing I set myself was to play on this idea of limitation and, and being trapped is I wanted to only photograph outside of the circle so I looked at the um the path as a boundary and I photographed only looking outwards which felt like quite a limitation because there was so much exciting stuff looking inwards but then it also forced me to really explore this other world um, so all these pictures have been taken looking out of the frame but ultimately for me, these line drawings, which look, you know, I've, I've got this on my website and the line drawing to, to an onlooker just looks like a little doodle. But for me, the line drawings were actually the most important part of this project. This was about memory. It was about how did I remember the walk? So when I was getting home, I would sit down maybe an hour or two later, once my feet had stopped throbbing and uh, I'd had my can of Coke to get myself back alive. And I would draw how I remembered the route, so where the road crossing was, where a gate was, where we went to a field. They were really these kind of like little memories. And each time I did it, you know, they'd be different. You do it in one direction, the other direction, and these routes, you know, they're, they're really personal little experiences. So it's all tied together. Um, again, with extra components. So I collected, whenever we went off route or got lost, I picked up stones. Um, and you know, I also then looked at the text and the novel and the mythological elements. This, uh, you know, Ivanhoe is a it's a story based within history that's completely made up, and I really wanted to play on that within my photography that I could start telling that story through my photography. But ultimately, it's it's a fiction. You know, this this is not this is not real world. Um, so the feather of an ostrich. So I've taken similar to what I did earlier. I've taken the text from the book and started working it in with the images. With the with the images, yeah. So this remains ongoing. I think everything I do I remains ongoing. I'm not very good at finishing anything off or putting anything on the shelf forever. But it led me into this curiosity of map, location, boundaries, um, and obviously the border between England and Wales was something that became really significant at this point. Um, so back, um, it's actually, I think it was, the, I think the next slide, that's 5th of July, yeah, this is just some text I'd written up at the time. Um, so 5th of July, um, just the day before the borders um, reopened, um, we were staying at my mum's, um, as her support bubble and she lives just on the borders and um, so I was just like come on last day we can go over and see the border before it opens what a phenomenon this will never happen again um, so we went off to um incredible little location near Whitchurch the Fens and Wixall Mosses um, which is um, such an interesting scientific and historical place um, was used um, within the war. It's got all these unique lands. Um, 
So went off, um, you know, sign of the times. I think this picture just screams um, everything about the sign of the times. The gate shuts, the NHS flag out, um, flag of the United Kingdom battered to bits. Um, so we went off, um, so this is the location here, this is the map, and what you can see here in the map is the border that cuts straight through the fence. And anyone who's ever walked in, a, in Mosses will know that Mosses know no boundaries. Um, you don't know where you are. Paths don't exist forever. Nothing lasts forever in a moss. Um, you know, we were out in these mosses and we could have been in England and we could have been in Wales. And that's why I found this a really fascinating place to be because it's this idea of this enforced government ruling of location and with what you can do within your movement, but then the human reality and nature's reality of how that's not actually really possible. Um, so in the location, I was photographing this idea of borders and boundaries. So looking for fences or significant like moments that would show where the borders and boundaries were. And all over the moss are these um, sticks with uh, either a bit of material or tape. Um, and I assume these are identifying, um, you know, scientific reasons. I I'm not sure on the reason exactly, but all over the mosses you'll find these. Um, they're not the England Welsh border. Um, they don't. They don't follow a straight line. They are something much, much less um, dominant within this narrative. Um, so I was out here. You know, I always thought this was just a one-day project. I really did. I genuinely thought, you know, the next day the borders were opening, um, everything was going to get back to normality. And I honestly can't believe that we're here. You know, April. You know, twenty. 21 are we in a year later or nearly a year later and you know this narrative has has returned um so experimenting with different ways to explore laying them out and this idea of the unknown is the red signifying one country is the blue signifying another country are these borders showing this or are they not um, and again, I'm playing around with this idea of the uncertainty, the maybe, what if, does it matter, who cares, um, sort of ex exploration um, and trying out this layout that I've, I've been exploring in projects before in the past, but never with such a real reason. Um, I love this project that Wolfgang Tillman did, um, New World. Um, I like the complexity of how he brings together all these different views and presents them as one. Um, so this, this is a project that's a lens on the world um, and it tries to create a singular view on the world, but from all the different angles. So these are, you know, the photographs across the globe, um, it's close to home as Nottingham, London, um, to overseas, um, Africa, you know, you really explore different locations and overlaid the images so that if we look up here in the top right hand corner where you've got the two images, the two portraits, where half the image has been cut off and it's such an important image, but he's dared to literally slice it off as if it's forgotten, as if it's not individual, as if it's intertwined into this next image, as if this is an ongoing moving narrative. And that idea of, um, of that has sort of tied into my progression with this project. So obviously the borders um, have closed again, um, not currently, but they have. Um, and that border, you know, it separated me from a family as well. Um, and I know everyone's got their stories within this and I know a lot of people live on the borders. And that's where I feel it's really important to explore this. Um, because we look, you know, it comes from London and it, it comes from Cardiff in a black and white England, Wales narrative. But having been brought up on the borders, I went to school with people who lived in Wales. I went to my, you know, my, my youth clubs with people who lived in Wales. I didn't know who was from England, who was from Wales. You know, half of them went to school in Wales. I didn't know. And to me, there was never a border. There was never a boundary. And there was never another, as much as the far Wales was this mythical place, the near Wales was just Wales. Um, so... I have since um, this January, um, when I moved back um, to Cheshire, um, I have been out photographing the borderlands um, every weekend, um, going to different areas across the border within that area, within my local area.
playing it safe. Um, and I've been photographing these, um, just what I find along the way. And, you know, these are much more um, human interactive locations than what I've done in previous work. You know, borders never seem to be left alone. They always have traces of things. Um, whether it is the waterway or whether it's towns and communities um, or even if it's just signs or symbols to identify that it is a border. Um, so all these little moments that identify where you are or where you're not. And obviously I've taken all of these from the English side. Um, but I feel within this collection of images, there's, there's definitely a fracture going on. There's definitely a fragility. Um, and there's definitely something really precarious about it. Um, but what I've decided or what I've worked out with this project is that I want to expand it beyond just simply looking English-Welsh border, but to look at this in a much more of a mythological sense. Um, because when I look at these images, there's nothing to say whether I'm in England or Wales. And I really don't want to be defining that either because then that starts becoming black and white and this is not black and white. Um, so I'm going to be exploring this further, looking at um, borders in general, you know, I want to take images and I want to present them to show their borderline and cause people to look at that, what's different on one side to the other. Um, and I think this, this, <laughs> this image screens volumes to me. So this is um, the River Dee that splits between Fondon and Holt. And um, this is, you know, just a kid's swing. You can swing across the river, you can swing from one side to the next, from one country to another. You're swinging it across, you're breaking the law, or were up to about a week ago. Um, but it just you just don't want to do it, do you? Let's be honest. Um, and I feel like there's so many connotations in this image. If we echo back to what Ethan was talking about in his talk and how every little element within the image can have a narrative, I think this one, just to the way the rope, the way it's on and the way that wood looks like it's going to slip out any moment. I think this is um, kind of the most symbolic image I've created to date. And it was these images that made me start thinking about this mythological approach. Um, so walking along the border and I'm finding symbols, Scottish flags, and I'm finding cut up credit cards with the American flag on them. Um, and it's starting to make me question, where am I? And does it matter where I am? Um, so the Borderland project is ongoing and it's going to continue to develop um, and this is something that we've talked about with the North Wales project is how do we respond photographically to the current political climate um, and the current social climate and this is, uh, this is my response to it and I want to open it out um, and start talking more to the people who are on the Borderlands and who are experiencing this new this new way of life you know there's so many rules when you live even in the midlands of england but never mind trying to comprehend these different complexities of rules that are going on and the uncertainty of it and i'm sure there's lots of different opinions within there that i definitely want to try and just um absorb and allow that to come through in my photographic practice so obviously the cross-border travel has now resumed um, when I put this to started putting this together, it was from tomorrow, um, but that was that was a few weeks to go now, um, and I have had the absolute pleasure of finally going to see my dad, um, who is absolutely fine. I was I don't think I was really worried, um, but he lives without internet out in a out in Wales. I've not not seen his face for some time, so to get over there and uh, yeah, he's uh, he he looks like a wild man. He's not not cut his hair or shaved in months. Not that he needed to, he's always cut his own hair, so I don't know why. I think he just wanted to join in the lockdown uh, journey. But he's absolutely fine, and it was nice to be over again. I got to explore from the Rhinogs and have a have a wander. Um, and get back to Abigail Orwin Woods. Um, so here are just two images that I've taken um, on this time. Which, strangely, I came away and looked at my camera, and I started shooting in portrait, which uh, you haven't seen that in any of my work. It never, it never seems to happen, but uh, here it is. Um, so, just to finish, I just wanted to leave you with my list of words inspired by Richard Long of what is my photographic practice about. And my work is about land. It's about literature. It's about maps and walking. Experience, sharing, belonging, environment, passion, history, and a sense of flux. Nothing is certain forever. Thank you.
Well, lovely. Thank you very much, Hazel, for a fantastic talk and very inspiring. Oh, thank and you. I found very inspiring to see how you approach your projects, the methodology you use, and how you rely on other sources and artists, be they photographers or writers, and then take it from there and build on previous artworks and ideas. I think it's great because I myself sometimes feel a bit hesitant because I feel like, oh no, it, it, it might be too perceived as probably copying or imitating, but of course it's not, it's not at all. Yeah. So to break down this barrier in my head, I, I, I think it's really to reinforce the message there, go out, look what has been done and build on it. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with it, fantastic. Um, the audience is um, invited now to uh, ask Hazel questions, either via the chat function or unmute yourself and um, speak to Hazel directly. In the meantime, while you type or formulate your questions, I would like to um, uh, point out a sentence I've read actually this morning. And it relates to what you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, Hazel, when you go out into the landscape and you start thinking about how can you convey um, what you feel and what mm. and the way you respond to um, to, the la to the to the landscape, and of course many photographers say, oh, you have to go out with a concept, with a project in mind, because that shapes and focuses the way you look at. And others say, go out like an empty vessel and just absorb and be receptive and look and take it in and then do something with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I recently bought a lovely book and I cannot pronounce the name of the photographer. So I'll hold it, hold it up here in front of the camera. Hope you can. Uh, yes, I have one of his on my shelf. A yes. photographer and he talks about um, the landscape and how he responds to it. And there's a lovely quote in it. And I would like to read this one out. Um, but he talks about editing and making the final cut of all the negatives and pictures he accumulates during a project and then making the edit and final cut for the final output, an exhibition or a book. And he says, well, this photograph, he talks about the particular photograph and many others didn't make the final cut. I still made them, the pictures. Mm -hmm. I trust whatever hits me at the moment and take the picture. I rely on the editing process to ultimately hone in on what I'm trying to say. Go out there and shoot everything, mm. then edit rigorously. Mm. And I think that's fantastic advice and I uh, took a resolution to stick to it basically. Yes, be open, be receptive. We don't always need to know where we're going with our project. Mm. It can help to focus, but it can also sort of erect another board, not the physical one or geographical one, but one in our head. And I think it's, it, it's important to have these things flexible. Now, we have, ah, we have a, a message from Sandra Roberts. She says, thank you, Hazel. That was truly inspirational. Love the way you work and come up with your projects. Oh, I can only you. share that. Thanks. Now, anybody else would like to uh, ask Hazel some questions or comment on something or share um, your own experience, how you approach the landscape, how you approach projects, yeah. please. I'd love to hear, yeah, the differences between how people work. So I think landscape is one of those things that's um, it's a really personal location to be in and the way you respond to it is really personal. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a huge history of landscape photography out there, isn't there, with all its uh, stereotypes attached. So yeah, I'm intrigued to, to hear. Can you see the chat function? Um, I can, yes. Uh, Stuart Bridewell has, has, is asking you a wee question. Okay, okay. So, having completed a degree in photography recently, I wrote my final project on mindful photography. Can you relate to mindfulness in some of your work? Absolutely. And I think this is the complexity that I dealt with is my practice of going out and making photographs is completely a mindful experience. It's being in the mountains, being out, putting um, fear and adrenaline into my system is all a mindful experience. And I need that for myself. Um, the creating of the photographs really helps me in terms of fragmenting the world and 
seeing how I look and I love just turning something that's an everyday view beautiful on just a walk you know you're walking along and your eyes see something and you can change it so that experience is completely mindful but what I didn't want to start doing was creating outputs that talked about the mindfulness and that was something I was really consciously aware of um, so I feel my images on their own can do that and I didn't want to force that because then I think it becomes something much more complex so when I had that connection with Gwen and her book now she doesn't talk about mindfulness at all in the way she writes you know she does not refer to the mountains that way not in the way Robert McFarlane does he really does talk about that concept but even when I read her text it was a mindful experience for me um, and that's what I was really conscious of is that the mindful and the personal experience is personal and what I wanted when I share my work to the viewer is to enable the viewer to get their experience and their um, mindful requirements all, all completely separate from that um, so yeah I think yeah good question it's definitely part of the practice but not what not what the surface end result what I wanted it to be yeah it's more the practice the doing yeah. Hiya, Hazel. Hi, would you, um, would you say that your work was more a response to the landscape, or would you say that the landscape was more the medium or the language that you used to convey your message? Oh, it's completely a response to the landscape. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't go out there. I think the Borderlands, maybe I am taking on the secondary of what you're saying there, actually. I think the Borderlands project is me trying to look at this in a slightly different way, going out of a bit more of a concept, a bit more of a drive. Um, but definitely I'm responding to the landscape. I'm not forcing anything. It's where it is. It's what it appears. Um, but I think as I start bringing more of this mythological element within it, um, which came from the Ivanhoe, I think I'm definitely going to be in that second category um, to some degree. So, yeah. Awesome. Responding predominantly, but yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Are there any more questions? Please just unmute yourself and talk to <laughs> Rachel. Uh, Hazel, sorry, I'm getting all confused. <laughs> all right, I gave any name. Oh, I must have been thorough. Oh, <laughs> if anyone doesn't want to ask a question on here, you can, you can come to me separately. I'm oh. always up to chat. Hazel, can you hear me? It's, it's Rob. Oh, yes. Hi, Rob. Hi. Um, I'm really sort of inspired by the fact that you've just gone beyond photography um, and, you know, combining text uh, to, 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 to really get under your skin. Have you got any suggestions of any other sort of media you would play with or we could use along with photography? You know, something maybe, maybe audio, have you thought about that? Or some people use found objects, don't they? Uh, you, you, you did that. You had a picture of a feather, didn't you, uh, with your Ivanhoe series. You had any more ideas of the things we could incorporate into uh, our photography that go hand in hand with the images? I think everything and anything. I don't think there's a limitation on that one. You know, the maps, the text, um, objects. Um, I've done audio recordings in the past and, you know, a bit of moving image. I think we um we, t we try to be quite medium specific and i think it's something that i've always tried not to be in my work um I, I struggle sometimes calling myself a photographer because i really feel like i'm an artist i really feel like i'm trying to create something that's um you know photography is my tool it's what i'm trained in it's how i can i can translate the world really easily through it because i have the knowledge and the experience whereas someone can grab a paintbrush and they can paint something and um, so i really see myself as an artist and i really think we shouldn't be so medium specific sometimes in the way we work. So if I think about one of the projects I did some years ago, I was living in an old, um, an ex monastery and it had cracks all over the walls and the place was falling down. And I started photographing the cracks because I was fascinated by them. But as I tried to explore it, I eventually realized that what I needed to do was not photograph the cracks, but actually recreate the cracks. because I was going to be exhibiting this body of work. So instead of, exhibiting photographs I exhibited sculptures so I took imprints of the wall and put the imprints into the exhibition to show the building's um, fragility so I think you can take any medium um, I've, I've kind of I've, I've definitely leaned on and I'm very reliant upon photography at this moment and obviously that's what I talk about and teach every day um, but I do think you can 
anything. I think sculpture is incredible. I think photography and sculpture are almost the same thing. They're just, you know, un unfound objects. Thanks, Hazel. So it's not all about the camera then, is it? I really enjoyed yeah. the talk. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Cheers. Well, it's all gone very silent again. <laughs> A question has just popped through that I've just seen. Oh. So from Becca, I feel there's a real sense of bravery about the way you've chosen to capture simplicity in your images of the trees. I find it really challenging to capture everything that I would want to in an image that is so simple. How do you manage to do this? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I, the framing is so important. Um, and not to talk too much technical, um, but I do shoot always on a 50 mil fixed um, because it forces me in terms of the way I look at the world um, and how I, I can get really in tune with my environment. Because if I had a variable lens, I would be able to take a distance and make it near ground and take a near ground and make it distance. Whereas when you're on a fixed lens, it forces you to always know when you pick up your camera what part of the tree you're going to capture or what part of the landscape you're going to capture. So you get so much more in tune with your tools. Um, so I do think having that fixed lens enables me to know whether I need to take two steps forward before I've done it. So I can look at the environment, take a few steps forward. And for example, this, this waterfall, the Abergan Orwin Falls, um, you know, I could have put in the skyline at the top, but I very, very consciously didn't want that because it had blue tone in it. So I knew I needed just to step up a little bit before I took the photograph to give myself a space around it to be able to capture that. Um, so I think it is very much being in tune with your tools and knowing what you do and don't want to include. And I think I, I leave out a lot and I leave in only what I need. Quite selective. Mm. I think it's a real challenge to, you know, kind of strip everything away which doesn't need to be in the picture, remove mm. all the extraneous detail and really focus on it. Because I think intuitively we have the tendency to pack loads into it mm. or not being aware what's in the picture around the frames because we know what we want in it and that's what we focus on but of yeah. course our perception is already filtering everything else yeah. out until we look at the picture so it's always helpful uh, to look at your pictures in a mirror or backwards because all of a sudden you see those things that you thought you'd left out they're still left yeah. in yeah uh, so yeah. just flipping an image all of a sudden you're like oh oh gosh i thought oh it's wonky i didn't think it was wonky because your head straightened it up um, but yeah, they're, they're little games you can play, which are just a bit of fun, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, thank you. If there's no other question or comment, then I would like to thank Hazel again uh, to deliver this talk to us tonight. We're inspiring, deep, full of meaning. And I would also like to thank the attendees to come along tonight and ask questions and give that lovely feedback. And um, if there's nobody else who wants to speak now, then I shall conclude the meeting for tonight. Thanks again to everybody and to Hazel. Hazel, Rob, Ethan, please stay on for a minute. And I wish everybody all the best and see you hopefully next time in May at Robert Law's talk. Goodbye, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>